Hello, I'm Shelley, and I would like to introduce my friend, Dr. Virginia Simpson, who is going to be joining us today to talk about grief. Dr. Simpson is a grief specialist. She has been in the field of grief since 1985, but has been learning about and experiencing grief for her whole life. And she also is an author of a book after caretaking for her mother of going through COPD. Uh, is that correct? I, I, I see confusion. It's good, it's good enough. She had more than that, but go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. Um, would you like to share some uh, more detailed information? I know that you were the founder of um, an organization that specialized in grief that is unfortunately um, now defunct. And you have many, many accolades that I think that you could uh, more personally share. Okay. Um, I was the founder of the Morning Star Center for Grieving Children and Their Families, where I worked with children of all ages and also their parents. I have, in my career, helped people deal with every loss you can imagine, some so horrific, you, it, it's unbelievable, and I'm not allowed to share any of these things other than from people who've told me it's okay to share. And one such loss would be the family that was brought to my center where the father had uh, killed the children's mother by chopping her up and putting her into a, rolling up her up into a rug. And to be with those kind of children during such a, a horrific loss that they have gone through and also their grandmother who lost her daughter who was now raising those children was really quite a remarkable experience. And children always show us the resilience of the human spirit. But a lot of people say, well, children are just naturally resilient. Uh, I think we are resilient, but we also need some help in finding that resilience. It's not always something that is just there for everyone. But children, adults, everybody needs to be heard and understood so that they can feel comfortable taking whatever new steps they need to do. When, when people aren't heard, what whole happens is it's like whatever they're going through becomes glue that they get stuck to. And it gets louder and louder because they really want somebody to finally hear their pain and acknowledge it so that they can breathe again easy and know they have been seen. I think that you are spot on with that, which brings us to talking about today. So this, this topic that we're gonna talk about today is uh, caregiver, caregiver grief, because we're talking about Charlie's dementia journey. And as you know, Charlie has two dementias and I am now a caregiver. Yes. And I have noticed that there's this completely different kind of grief than I've ever known before. And I've lost 30 people in my life but there's a grief that you feel on a daily basis when you're losing that person every moment. You speak to something I think so important because people always uh, talk about anticipatory grief. And I don't think it's anticipating the grief. I think you're grieving, as you said, for every loss, every single solitary day. It's not that you're sitting there going, well, I'm anticipating the death at the end. You're anticipating nothing. You're seeing it every day and it's heartbreaking. It is incredibly heartbreaking and hard for other people to understand unless they've actually had this experience of watching somebody become different every single solitary day and there's nothing you can really do about it. It's heartbreaking and scary. It's scary. Yeah, it, it is scary. And uh, I, I think of the, the fear is you're losing not only the person in front of you, but you're losing the, the memories that you share with them and the pieces of yourself. Absolutely. I, I know that I'm struggling with you know, all different emotions, you know, anger, fear, sadness, and I'm connected with different groups online, support groups, because I think support is really important, especially during this. And it's fantastic that we live in today's day and age where you can have virtual support. And what I'm understanding is that other people are having the same kinds of um, issues that I'm having. So I thought that we could discuss maybe some 
uh, issues surrounding grief support and what we're feeling and normalize that if we can. I think anything you're feeling is normal. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we have a range of feelings as human beings and for some reason, people have been given the idea we're not supposed to have them. We're not supposed to use them. I know there, there's a few words that when somebody says it to me, it's like, oh, just think positive. It's like, oh, really? And all that says to me is you're not somebody I can talk to. You're not somebody I can share because you're acting as though if I'm telling you the truth of my experience, somehow that's being negative and it's not, it's just being realistic. And we get to be realistic about the experiences in our life. And we all need to be heard about that, heard as we're going through things. We need to be listened to, we need to be validated. And inside us, we have to know that we're not gonna stay stuck there. Like I like to say, you can visit these emotions, but don't make a home there. I love that. I love that. So um, one of the things I, I really wanna you know, talk about is the five stages of grief. And you and I have talked about this you know, a couple of different times. Mm -hmm. There are no five stages of grief. This is something the media has kept alive long before its shelf life. Um, those of us who work in this field have known for many, many, many decades, there are no five stages of grief. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was talking about what people go through when they are dying. And there has been no research that has supported the five stages of whatever when somebody's dying, grieving, or anything else. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a wonderful person. Her work was very important in the field, but even she will tell you that everyone has a unique process in dealing with their grief. She would have told you that. She knew that. She also never said that the stages were something that you went one, two, three, four, five. She recognized that the, when you're going through grief, any kind of grief, you are revisiting things all over the place. So grief is more phasic than it is a stage kind of thing. There is no end date. It's part of our lives. It becomes incorporated in who we are. And there's much be better, healthier ways to look at how we grieve. And the stage theory, I would like to say, please get it out of your repertoire, everyone. It does not exist. Grief is phasic and there's healthier ways to deal with your loss that will help you more to think about it. I, I have always thought that grief was like a crazy roller coaster. A crazy and Crazy roller coaster. Oh, it is. Months. Absolutely. But then, even after losing 30 people, each one had its own different ride. Exactly. And that's because the relationship with everybody is different. And one of the parts of grief, and Stephen Levine, who was wonderful, he, he wrote a book called Who Dies many years ago. And he said, everybody we know acts as a mirror to who we are, to ourselves. So through them, we can see parts of ourselves. And part of what we're grieving when they're gone is there's, we can't see part of ourselves. So that's part of the feeling of loss, of being lost after somebody has died, because part of us is invisible to us now, because that person who reflected it back to us is no longer there. And we're trying to find it without them. Who am I? Like, for example, when my mom died, who am I if I'm not my mother's daughter? When I'm nobody's daughter, who am I? in this world. So everybody goes through that in their own way with each person because each person showed us something special that nobody else shows us. So I, I love that, you know, that, you know, who, who am I without that person? How do we figure out how to grieve and also how to live while caretaking for someone with dementia? That's really difficult. Um, it's, you're asking a very hard question. My best friend just went through this, her husband died a year ago after Alzheimer's, and it was incredibly debilitating to have to see what he was going through because it's not just the memory that's lost, the, the acting out that goes on as they're losing their memory, the uh, terrible things that go on, the disappearances where you're trying to search for them because they don't know where they are and they might have left the house and, and all the ways you have to change your whole life to make a safe environment for them. Plus, um, especially she got caught in COVID, so she, it wasn't like she could go out and take a walk 
or be around people because COVID had, had altered everything. So it was trying to find help. And that's very important. Get help outside yourself. There's resources in every community that's going to help you, not just a support group, but other groups. I know uh, there's some, it's probably an aging group in where people live that can also help give you some respite where they'll come and provide somebody who can come see you. I recommend people get involved with hospice because hospice, is, hospice has changed. You don't have to be immediately terminally ill and going to die any second. You don't have to give up having care. It, it's more than palliative care now, but they will also provide some respite for you, some help for you. And I think you need all the help you can get. Nobody can do this alone. And anybody who thinks they can is going to be very surprised. And also, it's not a weakness to say you need help. It's not a weakness if it gets to be too much to have that person in your home anymore. Sometimes the best thing you can do for both of you is let them go somewhere else where you can just love them and let somebody else do the caretaking. I, I just felt such a sense of relief and release when you said that and I got goosebumps because I think that's such an important thing for us as caregivers, especially of the Lewy body dementia, um, dementias to hear because with, I don't know if you know, but with Lewy body dementia, there's a, a volatility that happens with the, the patients, with the, the people that we're caring for, they get angry, they get vicious, um, or there's the propensity to get angry. Charlie has not been like that yet. But um, in the later stages, they have hallucinations, they, they have uh, visceral anger, which causes um, a lot of emotions in the caregiver. And that's what I'm seeing in the, in the communities that I'm with right now online. How, do, how can I see this person as my husband or my father or my mother and take care of them when they're being so angry to me? And is this the person that I, you know, I can really care give for? Well, one of the things is forgive yourself first for being human and not having perfect emotions in response to everything that's going on. And I think that's what's so hard for us is we think we're supposed to be somehow turn into superhuman because we understand what's going on on the logical level, but there's also the emotional level. There's also the human level. And we have to know that we're gonna have reactions and they're not always gonna be pretty. And it's not like the movies because the movies always make it seem like everybody's very nice and it's very pretty and understanding. It's not like that. Maybe you're lucky and you could be, but very unlikely. So we have to forgive ourselves for being human beings, for having our own anger, for having our own frustrations, for continuously what it feels like on a daily basis failing. Because this seems to be very common because it's always like, I'm not doing enough. If only I had this, I could that. And we, we don't allow ourselves to just be human beings and understand the weight of what we're dealing with. I know for me one day, it was a very visceral image I had because I was running my, my center. My mother was really in heavy decline and I thought I was doing well. And one day I saw an image of juggling balls in the air and then they fell to the ground and sort of melted away like Dolly's clocks. <laughs> and that's when I realized I couldn't do any of it. I, wasn't, I couldn't do everything, I couldn't do anything and I wasn't doing anything well. And there were things I just had to let go of. And it was hard, it was hard because I expected more of myself and I had to, and, and of course hindsight's lovely because I've had time to review this and realize I did the best I could with what I knew at the time. And that's what we have to do is constantly forgive ourselves for just being human beings, living our lives. We're all doing our best and it's hard enough without us beating up on ourselves, thinking, oh, if only I did that, or if only I was more understanding, or I'm not like so-and-so who seems to be handling it so well. Well, we don't live inside other people's bodies. So how somebody looks on the outside doesn't necessarily show us what's going on on the inside. And there's a lovely image and grief of a duck, you know, calmly floating along the water. It looks wonderful. But if you went underneath, you'd see that duck's paddling like crazy to stay above the water and look nice on the surface. So even the person who looks like they're doing it so well, handling it so well, trust me, inside there's a lot of chaos going on. And they may yeah. not be in touch with that. We don't know. Yeah. So what are some tools that you can share with us? 
to maybe get in touch with, with that? Well, I think tools, not necessarily just about getting in touch, but you have to stay physically active. You have to uh, work out in some way because your body is going to need those endorphins from working out. I highly recommend breathing. <laughs> and a nice calming thing is take 10 breaths in, hold it for a count of 10, and then 10 breaths out. This is also really helpful when your thoughts start racing on you, is to stop and breathe and breathe. And also to remember that just because you're having a thought doesn't mean it's the truth. You don't have to keep following it to whatever conclusion it might lead you to. And we do seem to think, oh, if I'm thinking that, that's really something important. Not necessarily. Our brains are real interesting. And they'll throw a lot of lies in there, especially when we're stressed. So if we can just sort of stop those thoughts by, mm, I think I'm just going to breathe right now and focus in on the breath. Your breath is your friend. It's free. <laughs> That's what I like to say. You know, I, I, I follow my breath all the time. And, you know, that's the one thing that I know that I have as my tool mm -hmm. where I can always calm myself. And I love, I love yoga. I, yes. I'm a great, I, I'm a yogi, I'm a meditator. And uh, I like to always bring my hands together in, you know, just like a, a yoga position. It's not a, it could be a prayer position for you, but uh, I just do this just to center myself and breathe and maybe stand or sit and just take a couple of breaths and say, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. There's a lovely app you can get called Calm. And she will guide you in a meditation, a you know, breathing, breath work, meditation for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to take a lot of your time. 10 minutes. Yeah. I, you say, you know, plus she has uh, a lot of videos on there to talk about different things. So that's something I would recommend. If you can't get out and do the yoga, certainly YouTube has a lot of things that are very helpful yeah. to all of us. Calm um, is a wonderful app. Um, then there's also Insight Timer is the one that I usually recommend because it's free. Calm, I think, has a, a, a price. To, I'm not sure. Sure, anymore. more. Insight um, in, Insight Timer. And one of the ones that I have been uh, recommending on there is there's this lovely meditation about I give you permission. And Ooh. nobody nobody needs permission to release or to um, just be, but there's this lovely meditation that I give you permission to just be you. And for some reason that has just been very helpful for me. And whenever I feel overly stressed or overly triggered, that one I'll go to on, on a regular, or I'll even just think about it, saying I have the permission to just be me and not be that caregiver. I don't have to be identified by, by any of that. I can just be me and figure out what that means. And because that's important too, is to know your, your needs are important. And that what happens when we're caregiving is we keep putting the other person's needs before our own. And there's a saying that goes on, uh, like if you're on an airplane and the oxygen runs out and the masks come down, you put the mask on yourself first. Because if you're not breathing, you're not going to be able to help anybody else. So you always have to make sure that you are taken care of so that you can do the best with your caretaking. If you're depleted, you're not going to be able to do that. And you will be depleted. There's no way not to, to be uh, depleted in some ways, but there are ways you can help yourself. Like we've talked about, breathing is very important. Exercise is important. Yoga is wonderful. Uh, Meditation is wonderful. Journaling, please write. We know that writing helps. So get a journal, have a place to put down your true emotions. Don't censor yourself. You're allowed to have ugly emotions. I hate to even call them ugly, they're just emotions. But we don't, we all have a dark side. We just do. And it, what I, I think one of the hard things when you're a caretaker and it's going on and on is part of us wants it over. And the trouble is over means that person dies. And it's a horrifying thought to think that you would want somebody you love 
to die and you don't really want them to die. You want them back the way they were and there's no way out. So we can be so hard on ourselves. And these are just natural feelings to want something that's so horrific to be over. And I think we have to acknowledge that and allow ourselves to have that feeling. And it doesn't mean you really want somebody dead. You just want their suffering gone and your suffering gone. Who wouldn't want our freedom when everything is just a, a nightmare? So we have to forgive ourselves for being human beings going through a horrible experience. And I just want to say, you just gave everyone permission. I hope so. so. Just, just like that insight timer, you just gave everyone permission just to own their feelings, whether they are the dark feelings or the lighter feelings, you just gave them permission to, to feel. Mm -hmm. and, and the way to light is to allow yourself the dark. Yeah. Absolutely. You, that's the way to light, not by shoving it down, trying to make yourself be happy when you're not happy. Because the more you shove it down, it's it's like something overstuffed, you know, like trying to stuff too much into a can and eventually it's gonna go, remember that old toy that would go <laughs> explode out when you open it. That's what happens to us. We become a pressure cooker. So you want to let those feelings out and help yourself as much as you can, but allow yourself to be who you are going through this experience. And like I've said before, don't get wedded to your ideas and your emotions. Just know this is a place I'm resting through now. I'm gonna take a look, sort out what's going and then going on to the next thing. You just don't wanna live in these more difficult places and, and, and spend your time trying to justify that you have a right to be there. You do have a right, but don't make it your residence because honestly, it's a terribly unpleasant place to live. Absolutely. So what, what I'm trying to do, and I know that this may be unrealistic for other people, I, I'm trying to find moments of joy with Charlie, you know, and, and just build upon those moments of joy and maybe put the, the other moments into a little box. So I, I talk to him about the things that he loves and I do journal about those things because I want to remember the positive, and I don't want to necessarily remember all of the sadness because I know that I know that I'm going to be grieving for a very long time. I know that this is going to be a years long process of grief. And I'd rather hold on to the positive than the sadness because I don't want it to affect my health. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. And I will say sadness is also our way to joy. It's part of the road to joy. It really is. And um, I know that when I wrote The Space Between, which was about my time caretaking my mom, having to put down all those sad feelings and cry over them like I was living them again, it freed up something in me that I didn't know needed freedom. So it's also a, a part of your pathway. And I understand not wanting to be sad. And I don't recommend just living in sadness, but also, again, it's part of the pathway to our joy. Oh, absolutely. No, I, when I said I put it in a box, I, I don't live in that sadness. I, I actually write about it. I, um, I know you do, but I'm, I'm talking pretty many yeah. like listening and thinking yeah. that I should just show it somewhere <laughs> else. That's what I meant. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want everybody to know that you can find moments of joy, whatever that is, your loved ones, um, passion, maybe it's cooking, maybe it's music, maybe it's dancing, and draw that out and enjoy it with them. Even if it's not your passion, yes. enjoy, enjoy it with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Give them something that they love and can hook onto in some way and that you can enjoy together. Also, what you're doing for yourself is you're creating memories that can make you smile through the tears you're definitely gonna be feeling. Oh, and I wanna share something in, that you can elaborate on that you advised me to do. Um, you said to me to start making a music playlist for Charlie. Absolutely. Uh, I have an end of life playlist for myself <laughs> that's on my all, my all my devices so that when I die, if I'm dying and I'm terminal and they know it, put my music on it. And this came because I used to be in hospice wards and they'd roll in a cart 
and put this music on that was, it was spa music. It was new age music. And I thought I would really want to be done sooner if I had to listen to this music. So I have created the list of music that wouldn't be your music, but it's music that touches me in deep ways or makes me just smile with happy memories so that I, when I am ending my life, I can go out with the joy of the music that I have loved. So I recommend this to everybody is create your end of life playlist. And the nice thing is, is as you create it, you can keep altering it and changing it as time comes on, goes on. I know that sometimes I'll hear a song say, oh yeah, I forgot I love that song. It goes on my list. And so I'm gonna get to hear the music I love. The reason for this too is not just because I love it and, and I, if I was terminal, but also we know music memory is the last memory to go. So when all else is going, the music, remember, is still there. And you can add joy to a person with dementia's life by playing music they have loved because that memory is the last thing. So... Uh, of reasons I, to have the music. Plus, it's fun to create your list and as you're putting it together, have, have those memories of your life come up. Yeah, and it's something to talk about and something to write about. Exactly. And you could, like, because Charlie's still alive, you could play the music and see if, he, if it sparks some joy in him, add it to his list. That's what we've been doing. And we've been actually talking about all of the different things that he loves that I had no connection to, but now I am connected too, because he's sharing it with me. How wonderful. So he's given you a gift. He is. He That's is. Wonderful. And uh, he's very lucky to have you because most people wouldn't sign up for what you signed up for. And, and I, uh, I just have to say, I admire that you have made this decision to be with him and also shown the strength to allow yourself to keep learning about what you're going through and what you need to do. And at the same third thing, reaching out to other people to help them while you're going through this. And I think everybody, that's another thing you can do for yourself. When you're going through a tough time, reach out to somebody else going through a tough time. Ellie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor, said the best cure for despair is help somebody else in despair. Yes, yes. Well. I, I can honestly say that you have helped me along this journey um, just in our private conversations. And I find so much value in your friendship and okay. in your knowledge. Thank you. And what would be like five bullet points that you would say to someone who are going through like, you could be this, you could do this? Well, um... Number one, as I've said before, forgive yourself every single day for not being perfect. Love that. Very important because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have feelings that you don't like. You're just human going through this experience. So forgive yourself, forgive yourself, and then see what you can do. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Eat right. Um, I would avoid sugar and alcohol. This is really important because both of those will send your... Um, your system going up and down and up and down emotionally and alcohol is a depressant. So you wanna have as much stability in your feelings as you possibly can. And through good eating, you can help yourself immensely. Um, they always say, get, you know, eight hours sleep. Well, good luck to that. <laughs> it's like, wait, there's some magic book I could do to do that without drugging myself. I haven't found it. So do your best to rest as much as possible. Add fun into your life. And if, even if it's just turning on the TV, there's so much on TV now that can give you something to laugh at. Like last week I watched uh, Who's Got Mail, that old movie with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And it was just delightful fluff. And sometimes we just need delightful fluff. And you don't always have to have meaningful things going on. So, you know, add in something every day, do something for yourself that tells you that you love yourself and you're worth it, you're worthy. You have to keep remembering because being a caretaker beats you down. It really does. Even the most optimistic person starts to hate their life. It's just hard. It, 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 it's, to say it's hard is not a good enough word. I can't even describe what it is because 
it's beyond just difficult. It's so many levels. So you have to find ways to tell yourself that you're worthy and doing something for yourself, something nice for yourself every day. Make sure you have a support system if you can. That's not, you know, fortunately you, you all have the internet to have these support groups. This wasn't existing when my mom died or if it was, nobody knew about it. So, you know, you have that and use it, utilize it because that's gonna normalize for you what you're going through. And um, ask people for what you need. That's the thing people forget to do. Our friends are not mind readers. And we think that if people knew, you know, they would just do it for us. Or uh, So we have to help them help us. And for those who have friends who are caretaking or are grieving, please don't say, call me if you need something. Call me if you need me. Call me if you want to talk. Because the person going through it is not going to call you. Spot it's not going to happen. Spot on. Thank you so much for saying that. Because I, I think that's like the easy way out saying, okay, I've done my, I've done my, you know, say, I, I don't have to do anymore. Mm -hmm. And leaving it on the person who is burdened. Mm -hmm. I, I, my friend, I don't ask her how she is. I know how she is. And she, what, what's she going to answer? So I might say, tell me about your day. Yeah, because every day is pretty darn awful. It's an opening, but how are you? It's like, how do you think I am? You know, do I have to answer that one again for the 10 millionth time? Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you something I'm doing with my best friend that I highly recommend. Um, she, her husband, like I said, died a year ago. And every morning we say good morning to each other. We text each other in the morning. Talk a little bit online about how our day is, what we got planned for the day. And every night say good night. Because she doesn't have her husband to say good morning or good night. So it's a very simple thing. And it's meaningful to both of us. It's not just that I'm doing something for her. I love that, that I get to hear what's going on every, read what's going on every day and, and the good night at night and know how the day has gone. So it's a nice way to connect without saying, you know, um, how are you? <laughs> You know, I, I think that's absolutely beautiful. And you and your friend have a very special bond to be able to do that. We do. We've been talking to each other for more than 50 years. <laughs> I, I want to say, you know, um, with regard to like me and Charlie, I've been doing the same thing with Charlie because I want him to know he is loved and he is important. And every day we start with, I love you. And Every day we end with, I love you. Oh, that's beautiful. Every day. Beautiful. I think it is so important to end, to start with, I love you. Um, and also remember to say, I love you to yourself. Yes. <laughs> we forget that piece of life. Oh yeah, I love you. Okay. You know, uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, I got up in the morning, I walked by the mirror and my uh, kind of got growled at myself for how I looked first thing in the morning. And I stopped myself and I said, you know, that girl needs to smile. So instead of whatever I was doing, I smiled back at the mirror. And you know, the rest of my day, the spring in my step was better. I went through the day smiling more. It doesn't mean that everything was cured that was going on during the day. I just felt better. And we forget to give ourselves that smile we need. So when you look in the mirror in the morning and you're feeling, oh, and tired, and you can't face another day, give yourself a smile because that girl needs it or that boy needs it. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that we didn't talk about because we were focused on caregiving grief is um, I noticed that Charlie's going through horrific grief every, every day. day. Yeah. Every day. There was a wonderful movie years ago called Tribute and uh, Jack Lemon's character was terminally ill. And he said something that's so true that I'm thinking of in terms of what with Charlie is that when you hear a friend of yours is dying, it means you're losing your friend. When you're dying, it means you're losing all your friends. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wow, we don't think about that. No, and-, and Charlie's losing himself too. Yeah. So of course he's grieving, it's horrible. And to those of us not going through what he's going through, it's not something we can even imagine. And if we imagined, we'd be wrong. 
because we can't know something until it happens to us. We really can't, we can imagine. And I'm sorry for what Charlie's going through. I'm happy for him that he has you because that's incredibly special to have somebody who's watching out for us during the hardest time in our life. So this is something to remember when you're with somebody who is terminal is one, never visit a dying friend. And by that, what I mean is, if you think you're visiting somebody who's dying, you have the attitude that they are in this other specter of life, which is death. What you have to know is you're visiting somebody who is going through the most extreme challenge of their life. The person who is dying will know the difference because they'll feel it when you come to them, that you're just visiting them versus you're visiting them who's a dying person. So keep that in mind that you're just visiting a person going through the most extreme challenge. And that way you can be with them because otherwise people get scared. I don't know how, I don't know what to say to somebody who's dying. Well, then don't go because that person's alive. And something else people forget, just because somebody's been diagnosed with a terminal illness doesn't mean they're the first one who's going between you and them. Exactly. You know, we could go first. We don't know. Yeah. So treat everybody as the human being they are, not with a label. So that's what I, that's my advice there. <laughs> I love that. I think that is, you know, amazing advice. And Charlie and I sit and have coffee. We talk about the news. We do Wordle. We just do very average, normal things. And we, I don't show up talking about death. And I don't, when he talks about death, I give him space to. Wonderful. Because I think that's important for him to have that. But I show up just as a friend. Mm -hmm. you know? And I would also, I, you probably do this, but for those listening, curiosity is very good when you're talking to people who are going through experiences. Be curious. Be interested in what they're going through. Let them know that you care by the fact that you are showing up and you're present and you've made yourself available to hear whatever it is they want to tell you. This is very important because, like we said, that person's not going to make pick up the phone. Let me call, let me talk to you about what this rotten day I'm having today that was along with all the other rotten days I've had today. We get tired of hearing ourselves just go through that. The other thing is, if you if you call your friend, don't call and complain about your husband, your child, your this and your that and the other. They don't want to hear it. They're going through their own stuff. <laughs> but it doesn't mean they don't want to hear something about your life. They'll let you know if they do, but they might be so overwhelmed that they can't think of anything else. So as the friend on the outside, let them be where they are and know this is beyond overwhelming. Even the strongest person is just overwhelmed to an extreme that others cannot even imagine. Um, and so just be kind, just be there, just be loving and just be open. You know, I had a, a teacher who said this, which I, I, I used when I, first time I was visiting a friend who had called me and told me she was going to die within two months. Wow. And it was show up, pay attention, tell the truth and don't be attached to the outcome. And if you follow those things, you'll just be present. And is that how you were able to care for your mom? Oh, that was, <laughs> you know, all my education, everything went out the window when it was my mother. <laughs> because, you know, I was her child. I was, this, you know, I, I was lost as anybody else. And, and uh, part of me, because it's my work, I, I was studying myself like I was under a microscope, to, microscope too. But I, hey, isn't this interesting watching Mimi Nuts? <laughs> as I was trying to figure this out, but I did have some skills because I had known way in advance to have the necessary conversation with my mother, which is, what do you want at the end of your life? What do you want me to do? Do you want heroic measures? We had already filled out what she needed to fill out that would give, tell me what to do, but we'd had the conversation. So I knew, I never had to ask my mother again, I knew, and it informed all my decisions. 
And I'm grateful for that because other people are going, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid I might be killing them if I do this or that. We never tried to do anything heroic to save my mother's life. That's what she had wanted. That's what I honored. And because of it, she had a good death. What happens to people is they're so busy trying to keep another person alive, they don't realize that they're amping the levels of suffering. And that's what can happen. So sometimes just to let nature take its course can be the best thing possible. So you need to know that. You need to know the questions to ask doctors that are going to give you the information you need. And to say to a doctor, you know, like if you have a terminal illness, you say to the doctor, can you help me? The doctor's going to say yes. They're not, most doctors are going to say yes. And you're going to be mad at the doctor who tells you the truth and says no. But your question might be, if I have, let's say, if I have the surgery, am I going to get the life that I love back? And these are the things I love to do. And the doctor might say, well, you might be alive, but you're not going to be able to do any of those things. And then you, you're better informed on the decisions you want to make. So you need to have these conversations. There's a, a thing called five wishes that can help you sort this out. You can find that on the internet. Uh, they even have a deck of cards that you can buy that you can sort of put these cards out and help you have the conversation with the person who might be resistant. Get those documents so that you can help each other um, know what you want. Wait one second, I want to show you a document, okay? Let me just get it, so let me show you. This is the, can you see this? Yes. It's a five wish document. It's, it tells you my wish for the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't, the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want, how comfortable I want to be, how I want people to treat me, what I want my loved ones to know. This is valid in most states. It's different than that, the durable power of turning for health cares that you have. It allows you to have more say, even in how your funeral is gonna look. So I highly recommend this five wish document uh, and uh, you can get that through Aging with Dignity online. Thank you. So I would really recommend it. It's, it's, it's agingwithdignity.org. I will put that link on this YouTube. Right, because I really like the things that you get to say in here that you wouldn't like. My wish for what I want my loved ones to know. How many documents have that? Uh, and the things about comfort and how you want people to treat you. So these, it's a lovely little document. And like I said, most states recognize this now. So, there, glad I got that one in. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. But have these conversations with your loved one while you can. So you know what they actually want and you have the document signed that you can take care of it for them. I'm grateful my mother had this peaceful death I have never gone back and thought, well, I should have this or we should have that. Never, because she gave me the roadmap I needed to follow. And I saw the benefit of that. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I will add um, the link for the five wishes and I will add the link for your book as well. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. I put the truth down in that. I did not paint myself as a special daughter. I had all kinds of not so lovely emotions. And, <laughs> and the funny thing, you know, in the movies, they always show the dead person looking lovingly at people as their last look. The last look my mother gave me was a dirty look. <laughs> That's the last time I saw her eyes. <laughs> and I didn't take it personal. She was, she was feeling some pain. But that's the last thing I saw. So I, you know, I kind of laugh at movies where it always, you know, the violins are playing and everybody's looking lovingly at each other. It isn't always that way. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, you never know what you're going to get, and you know, no, no. over over time, um, you know. over time, when the person's gone, you will have plenty of time to revisit your relationship and everything you did and didn't do, and. One thing I will say that I think is important for people to know, hindsight can be very hard on us because in hindsight, we tend to paint a dead person as better than they were and our reactions to them as worse than they were. And we forget maybe that person wasn't easy and we were responding the best we could. And that's part of grief is revisiting that too so that we have a, a reasonable uh, view of what actually went on 
and knowing, again, we're just human beings doing our best. We really don't have a roadmap because what's a roadmap for me might be part of what you can use, but you're on your own path. And we all are. And there's no judgment. No judgment. No judgment. Mm -mm. No judgment from anyone around you and no judgment from yourself. And if you feel judgment from someone around you, that's not the right person to be around. It's true. And, you know, but it's hard not to judge ourselves. I mean, even all these years later with my mom, every once in a while I'm taking a shower and I'll think about something. And I'm, oh, I'm so sorry, mom. <laughs> but she would tell me, don't be. She would say, don't be. Because she knew. She knew. But it's that revisiting it. And that's part of grief too. We revisit a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, a lot of experiences. And it's coming to terms with allowing ourselves to have done the best we can with who we were. If I look back on what I did 17 years ago, I could be hard on myself maybe, but I know more now. I've learned more now. It's not fair. I did the best I could when I was in the trenches. Absolutely. And that's the other part we forget. When you're in the trenches of caregiving, stuff will come at you hard and fast at times. And you're just reacting, reacting, reacting. And you're doing the best you can. And that's the part of the forgiveness. You're doing the best you can. There is no such thing as perfect. It does not exist in this world. There's no such thing as perfect. So be a human being, go through your experience. If you need to be mad at yourself for a while about what you're doing, fine. If you need to judge yourself for a while, fine. But as I said, don't live there. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom today. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to be contacted by anybody who's interested in contacting me. Um, probably the best way, I guess, would be through my website. And you were going to put the link on for that. Okay. I will do that. And um, just know, anybody who's listening, you're doing great for just what you're doing, the fact you're even there and showing up. There's people that don't even show up. So please be as kind to yourself as you can as you go through this most, most difficult of experiences in life. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you and your time. And please buy the book because it's a wonderful read and it can help inform about some caregiving and challenges. And when Ginny went through some real normal um, issues. <laughs> so oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Definitely not a perfect person. <laughs> um, and it might not be caregiving uh, with dementia, but it's caregiving. And it's a very valid and important book. So I encourage you, you to, to pick it up. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.